Hi, this is Kirk, the Bariatric Carnivore. Well, if there's ever been a time in history when you might really want to consider getting to know a local rancher and start purchasing your beef by the cow, this may be that time in history. Um, let me try to, I'm gonna to try to bring together several convoluted different ideas, but hopefully it'll make sense toward the end and what the solution may be for you and your family. Now, one of the big things that I really am a big advocate for is using beef as primarily your main source of nutrition, using ruminant animals, meat-based nutrition, using real food. Uh, I think, you know, it's complete nutrition. It's a perfect human diet, and it will get you off of ultra-processed food and greatly improve your health. So that's my... I have a meat-based bias, so understand that up in the front. But here's what I'm seeing as far as a problem when it comes to the world agriculture situation. It started a few years ago when the, Russia invaded the Ukraine. Now, there's a couple of things with the, the sanctions that went against Russia that cut out basically a good hunk of the world's fertilizer. Uh, Russia was the number one producer of fertilizer on the planet. Suddenly, there's a worldwide shortage. Prices are going through the roof because people cannot purchase fertilizer from the, so the Russian uh, government. That's problem number one. Problem number two is Ukraine was one of the world's largest uh, producers of wheat. So all of a sudden, you've got you know two countries embroiled in a war, can't ship and sell their products, and you know a good hunk of the world's food is all hooked on those those two regions so that's creating problems that was problem number one problem number two was what i noticed over in sri lanka last year where the people that owned the debt of the Sri Lankan government were kind of woke environmentalist types and insisted that they cut down their usage of fertilizer and they suddenly went from a doing conventional agriculture to organic in the entire country almost overnight without a lot of you know preparation for it because of government edict and then there was a drought suddenly there's a major food shortage uh, crops are dying it ain't working and the farmers revolted, forced the president to flee the country. Um, government collapsed. I mean, it was a horrible situation with a lot of food insecurity and in a very impoverished country. So and that kind of got my attention, too, as we're looking at what's going on in the Ukraine. Then the problem started spreading to the first world particularly the Netherlands, where the government there, very liberal government, decided that for environmental reasons, <clears throat> farmers could no longer have cows. And they started telling them how many cows they were going to have to cull from their herd. They were taking a bunch of farmland, confiscating it for industrial development or housing and stuff like that. And the farmers started rebelling. And that led to a first world government collapse. The government of the Netherlands collapsed. Um, populist revolt happened this, you know, in the country's Senate elections, changed you know, who was going to be the president. Uh, a lot of the political turmoil is still being worked out over in the Netherlands. But it, it, the rebellion was spreading. Now the rebellion is only getting bigger there's you may or may not have heard about it but there's an organized farmers rebellions going on right now in france germany and spain all the major food production areas in europe are now with farmer strikes pushing against a lot of these environmental regulations and culling of the herds it's spreading now into ireland where the government is trying to kill large numbers of cattle Farmers just are not putting up of it. They are being squeezed at both ends. And part of the reason for this rebellion is also being seen in the country of India, where India is one of the, the biggest agriculture producer where they do not allow GMOs to come into their country. Now, there's a number of reasons why, but part of it is when you 
have a GMO crop, you don't really purchase the seeds. You license the DNA inherent within the crops. And these companies are very protective of their intellectual properties. And they have sued a lot of small farmers because because of cross-pollination, some of the DNA from the GMO crops ended up in other people's fields. Now, to me, I would have sued them for spreading their GMO into my organic crops, but you know that's a different story. But anyway, a lot of farmers have lost their farms over that issue, and they did not want to see that in India. And that is a battle royale where there's a lot of money. And people forget that agriculture is not farmers. Big Ag is major companies like Monsanto. And Monsanto, with their GMOs, create a very interesting problem for local farmers because when you plant the GMO crops then you've got to buy the GMO fertilizer and you've got to buy their specialized pesticides and as a result because of modern monocrop agriculture um, you can plant these type of crops basically in dirt. It doesn't require fertile soil because you're utilizing chemical fertilizer which is now in very short supply because of sanctions on Russia. So you've got a very odd situation with a lot of weird pressures and a lot of money being involved in it. Now, I know a lot of government officials and the way the media likes to portray it is, oh, we've got government trying to protect the environment. But frankly, I don't think they do. I don't think they care a rip about the environment at all. If they did, they would certainly be upset about what's going on in Central America because a good hunk of the Amazonian rainforest is being wiped out, not because of cattle grazing, but because of soybean production, the basic ingredient for all manufactured ultra-processed food. And what is happening is you know, the native diets are being wiped out. People are losing their farms they're putting in this monocrop soybean stuff that's all GMO. They're loading it up in the cargo ships, sending it up to North America where it's manufactured into ultra processed food and then shipped back down to Central America and all over the world by companies like Nestle and Unilever and others that are controlling a good hunk of the world's food supply. And frankly, you know, this ultra processed food is creating twofold problem in Central America. Um, people there are, you know, the rate of diabetes is going through the roof because, well, it's kind of what we found out in the United States when native populations that had not kind of grown up, you know, had at least a couple of generations of lead time where we started producing ultra-processed food, utilizing more flour, sugar, vegetable oils. Um, when Native American tribes suddenly got introduced to this, they would have an explosion within one generation of obesity and diabetes. And that's what's happening in Central America, where people within a generation are losing their traditional diets and suddenly going to a ultra-processed diet diabetes, obesity are going through the roof. So it creates several problems. Health problems, which are also environmental problems when you think about it, because it takes a lot of resources in order to treat people of all these different issues. It's destroying the environment, it's destroying the rainforest, which is you know the big <laughs> carbon sink on the planet. Uh, it's what takes out a lot of carbon dioxide and creates oxygen. And that's creating a problem. You've got very goofy uh, political leaders in a number of different countries that are pushing radical environmental agendas that may or may not have any real impact on anything. But they're creating what's possibly going to be a major food shortage worldwide because of bad policies. And frankly, they don't care. I mean, you know, think about the lockdowns. I mean, you know, government officials would t shut down small businesses and says, well, too bad to be you. You know, you can't open your restaurant anymore, but they still got paid. They didn't care. And frankly, they don't care. They're going to get paid. They're going to be fine. You're the ones who are going to suffer. So the question is, what do you do about it? 
Well, I, I kind of liken it to what they tell you on an airplane. You know, if the oxygen mask drops down, you put yours on first, then you try to help other people. You can't help other people if you can't breathe. So, I think, you know, your, your best solution is get out of the system. You know, if there was ever a time in the history of the planet when you might want to very seriously consider purchasing your own cow and getting out of a situation where right now, you know, if you like to eat beef and you buy yours at the supermarket, you are completely beholden to one of five manufacturers of beef. You know, we've only got five man major manufacturers of beef in this country on the commercial level. And frankly, uh, three of the five are not even U.S. corporations. So if they create another artificial shortage like they did with eggs uh, last year, we got a problem. You know, prices could go skyrocketing and there's not much you can do about it unless you have pulled yourself out of the system and are buying direct from a rancher. And that's what I did. When I started going carnivore a few years ago, I interviewed three different ranchers, tried their beef products, bought a you know, quarter uh, of a cow of each one, tried them all, picked the one that I liked, and uh, I love Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter, who uh, is the guy who grows my cows, you know, he's a small rancher. Uh, my cow does not get vaccines and doesn't get hormones. It is uh, minimal impact on the environment. I think he actually does wonderful things for the environment because he does a kind of a regenerative method. He has seven different pallets. He rotates his cattle around. He's producing topsoil. Uh, he's sequestering a lot of carbon. And the beef is phenomenal. I get it at a very inexpensive price compared to what I would have to pay even at a Costco. So I'm getting a better price for better quality meat and I'm helping, and he gets better prices than he could trying to sell it directly to the, on the market. So it's a win, 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 win type of situation. I think you can do the same thing. If you poke around, you're going to find there's lots of people out there that, you know, Look up your Cattlemen's Association. That's where I started doing. It was during COVID. Um, was when I was looking for ranchers. Found out that there was a bunch of them that were willing to sell direct to consumers because all the restaurants were closed. And it worked out extremely well for all of us. So look at alternatives. You don't have to be stuck in the same system. You can think outside the box. Preserve, you know, make sure that your family is taken care of. And then you can think about taking care of others. I mean, we're not going to can't save the world if you just can't take care of yourself. So, of all the times in history, this is probably the time to start looking for that solution. This is Kirk, the Bariatric Carnivore. I know this is a little bit different type of message, but look, food, good food is medicine. Bad food requires medicine. And if you want to get out of the system and you want to make yourself healthy, then you really do need to find the best food you've got. And I've got a meat based by it. Uh, bias, I admit it. I think that beef is the perfect food. It will certainly sustain you and keep you healthy, help get you out of the system. That's what this channel is all about. If you like this message, hit the like and subscribe button. Leave a comment below. If you found a farmer, if you found a rancher that you like, you know, please encourage other people to start taking a serious look at this while there's time. And I try to put out a couple messages every week. I will talk to you again soon.